Okay, I'm here with uh, Dr. David Williams, Acting Chief Executive of the UK Space Agency and Chairman of ESA Council. Um, Dr. David Williams, uh, the, the UK is strapped for cash at the moment. Um, how will this and, and the CSR uh, Comprehensive Spending Review affect the UK Space Agency? Well, to be absolutely honest, we do not know at the moment. Uh, we are in discussions in the department and with ministers. Uh, and like all other parts of government, we've been asked to look at what would happen if we had a 40% to 25% cut. We've also made it clear that we th feel that space is a growth area, and I think that's reflected in the innovation growth strategy and the case for space documentation we've had made. So we're, we're asking government to look at it from the perspective of, yes, you've got your overall spending constraints, but also we have a, an area here that is growing and, and is recognised as growing across the world, not just in the UK. Okay, with with this kind of the, the funding issues, uh, how do you see a see a distinct national program emerging? Well, with, with I, I should, I'd probably be honest to say with difficulty in the short term. I mean, from the innovation growth strategy, we've now got a, a team looking at the technology roadmap that we require in the UK. That will be developed over the few, next few months. We're looking at having an initial input to us uh, before the closure of the CSR. And in that context, the CSR at departmental level will be settled in October, but there then will be some further debate within the department before the final decisions inside the department are made. So there's a period there, but it's no doubt it's going to be very difficult in the short term to increase budgets. Hmm. And, and how do you see the evolution of the relationship between UK Space Agency, uh, ESA and, and the EU? Well, the, the big change in the last year, of course, has been the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, where Article 198 has come into play, which gives the European Union a competence in space. It's a shared competence with member states, so they're allowed to have a policy and programme for a European space programme that they need for their purpose. There is a possibility to coordinate across Europe if member states agree. But one thing they're not allowed to do is overtake national activities and direct national activities. So we, we see the, the Union emerging with a view on what they need for their own purposes, but that's already tempered by the fact that there are three areas that are priorities. One is Galileo, one is GMES, and the third one is the follow-on to the Framework 7 research programme, which we will call Framework 8 for the time being. Mm. And now that the ESA is now the executive arm of EU space policy, does, does that put it at odds with the EU's competition rules in terms well, it, it, of work it's, share? It's not got that far yet. I think we're still debating the the, the the treaty has said that the EU should establish appropriate relationships with ESA. But it's quite clear that the, at the superficial level, the difference between the two is, is the industrial return policy. Yeah. But if you look in the Framework 7 programme, uh, the Framework 7 is a, a shared cost programme with the organisations that bid for money, can, can either be 25 or 50%. The ESA telecoms programme, known as ARTAS, has got a 50-50 shared programme element. So, what, and on that basis you can see that the two are basically reasonably compatible for that type of programme. Mm. The difference is that the ESA one will have an a priori industrial return, so the countries who put money in will expect to get their money back against money from industry in their country, whereas the EU programme does not, it sets an a posterior industrial return. Right. It selects the best and it goes to the country that, uh, that has the best capability. So there are differences. Uh, so I think there is, there's further work to do on that, um, and there's further work to do on the relationship between ESA and the EU. Um, but looking long term, the thing that we cannot afford, either politically or financially, is for the EU to try and duplicate ESA. Right, okay. And, and do you envisage any, any UK-only programmes going forward, uh, uh, of sort of science missions or anything like that that would be... We, we, we haven't made that decision. The, 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 the nature of a space programme is that the commitment is quite long term. So if you look today, for the next two years probably, uh, and I've got the details, but around two years, there's really very little you can vary. So we have a window where we need to plan as the agency for decisions in the 212 time scale about what we'd like to change and how we'd like to change it, and whether we'd like to change it as well. And it's at that point that you consider whether you rebalance across ESA subscription to national subscriptions. Right, okay. Um, Professor Stephen Hawking said a few days ago that he supports human spaceflight exploration. How important is it, is it for, the, for the UK and uh, sort of space agency and you know, will Tim Peake, do you think, be the first of many? Well, well, 
I, I think that the, the first point is that exploration, space exploration is space exploration. It's different from space science, uh, and the, you know, the purpose, if you look at history of exploration, is to exploit as opposed to understand. But you need to do some science. And the exploration program requires manned, unmanned. It's a complete program. You can't just say, let's do the man part. And the UK is focusing its efforts on the unmanned part. Tim Peake is a European astronaut, uh, which is, you know, is quite entitled to be. And, and it will now be some time, I guess, before they have another call for astronauts, because the current batch of astronauts and new astronauts have limited slots for the next uh, 10 years anyway. So uh, I'd like to think, yes, he is the first of of a future grouping, but he's first and foremost European in terms of being an astronaut, and he just happens to have been born in Britain. Okay. Um, in defence, the UK and the US have partnered closely with uh, Britain contributing key capabilities to the special relationship. Uh, do you think this could be replicated in, in, in space, or is ESA Europe the only way forward now? And if, if we could get sort of team up with the Americans in that sense, you know, what, what, does, what does the UK bring to the table? But, but there are already serious engagement programs with the USA to European level. The weather satellites, which are operated by UMETSAT, an organisation based in Germany where I used to work, operate European satellites for weather, which are part of the global system and they interlink with the US system and the Japanese and the Russian. So there is actually a global network out there for weather forecasting, where the European element is an integral part of the system with the USA, and where you, the UK contributes financially and technically to the program. Mm. So I think I think there are areas where it already works and I don't see why we shouldn't just continue to build in that mode and and, and accept that, that there are different ways of implementing programs once you've agreed how that program should look. Okay. Um, on that sort of same, same sort of note, uh, there's no sort of talk of a UK military surveillance satellite capability, perhaps based on this Skynet type uh, model, uh, one, one name was sort of SkyEye. Um, what, what, sort of, what, what sort of changed here now that the, the UK is now exploring this? Well, I think it was a recommendation of the Innovation Growth Strategy that they'd found evidence that uh, across government there could be a, a demand that was greater than the, the, the ability of any one department to provide a service. And we've now got a team with industry looking at the details of that and seeing whether in fact there is an area where the UK does would, would be able to benefit from a a paradigm type service for, for EO data. That will take a little time to come to fruition and it's work in progress. Okay. Uh, one criticism that has been made um, of, of the UK Space Agency is the lack of progress since the launch since April. Um, what's your view on this? Well, my, my view is simple. Since, since April, we've had April and May when we effectively couldn't do anything because of PERDA for the election. We've had June and July where we've worked quite hard with a new government to get them to agree to continue the agency and we've done some of the groundwork and we've had August which being a holiday month is difficult to coordinate across government so we've had two months of effort since April and I think we've done quite a lot given the time scale we're still on schedule for an April up to 11 full launch okay um, my final question then is um, how important is the UK Space Agency now in going to be inspiring the next generation of scientists engineers possibly astronauts are you planning many outreach campaigns? Is that part of the plan? Yeah, I mean, we, we have a short-term difficulty that, that the government has effectively put a blanket ban on advertising and outreach this year, but that hopefully is just a short-term issue. We are doing already doing good things. We have a, a, a space group up at the University of York looking at the curriculum, which is jointly funded with Department of Education and the European Space Agency. It's known as EDRO. We are looking at creating a UK space symposium next year, bringing together two or three of the ones that exist and, and giving a, a UK flavour across it. So we are looking at, at rebranding re uh, outreach and we are looking at continuing our education uh, and having a strong push on that side because space does, I think does help people going to STEM subjects. Brilliant, okay. Well Dr Dave Williams, thank you much for your time. Okay.